Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the May 11th, 2020 meeting of Belleville City Council. Um, we uh, gather today under the terms and conditions of a provincial declaration of emergency, as uh, we are all uh, aware, very aware of the seriousness of these times. I wanna thank our staff for assisting in the setup of the second ever electronic meeting of Belleville City Council. And I want to also thank all members of council for their cooperation and flexibility in meeting under these unusual circumstances as permitted by the provincial government. For those that are watching from home, um, I can direct you to the city website where the full agenda uh, is on there with all the reports that council will be considering. Um, and then there will be an archived copy of this meeting as well there for future reference. I will call the meeting to order and state that all members of council are present. I am here at city hall and all other members of council are present electronically. Uh, earlier today at 2 p.m., City Council met in closed session to discuss a motion moved by Councillor McCaw and seconded by Councillor Kelly uh, that the following items, that the Council enter into in-camera session to consider the following items pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act. There were four bullets. The first bullet was in-camera report number DCS 2020-20 regarding personal matters about identifiable individuals pursuant to Section 239-2B of the Municipal Act. Bullet number two was in-camera report number DCS 2020-21 regarding potential acquisition or disposition of land pursuant to section 239-2C of the Municipal Act. Bullet number three was in-camera report number DEDS 2020-06 regarding advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege pursuant to section 239-2F of the Municipal Act and a review of the regular in-camera meeting minutes of April 20th, 2020. That motion, uh, as I said, was moved by Councillor McCaw, seconded by Councillor Kelly and carried. I will now ask uh, City Clerk and Director of Corporate Services, Matt McDonald, to lead us in a moment of reflection. May we be worthy custodians of all that has been entrusted to us. Help us to be concerned only for what will promote good government. May we bring to our council chamber minds that think and hearts that feel. Always having respect for others so that we may serve the people of our city in a helpful manner and for the good of all. All right, thank you. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interests and general nature thereof. So I have a... Um, I'm going to disclose an interest. It's not a pecuniary interest, but it's item 8B10, which deals with a temporary noise um, with a temporary uh, noise permit application for Myers Pier. In the past, I've declared a conflict on these and have not participated. But because the provincial declaration of emergency requires the chair of these meetings to be present at City Hall, I cannot pass the chair to someone else to. Um, uh, to, for that portion of the meeting. So I will participate as the chair and not make any comments, um, but I um, will not be, I, I, I'm disclosing a interest in that item. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move to public meetings. There are no public meetings today. Reading and confirmation of the minutes, regular council meeting minutes of April 20th, 2020, and the regular in camera meeting minutes of April 20th, 2020. Need a motion to approve those. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, moved by Councillor Culhane, seconded by Councillor Williams. Any discussion or questions on that item? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? It's carried. There are no deputations today, and we have uh, three items of correspondence. Um, item number uh, seven one is a letter from Quinney Healthcare regarding parking spaces, and the resolution is that the February twenty first, twenty twenty letter from Quinney Healthcare requesting the implementation of paid street parking along the north side of North Street be received and referred to the Transportation Committee. Uh, Councillor Thompson is moving it. I need a seconder. Councillor uh, Carr is seconding it. Any discussion on this item? And again, uh, for the benefit of the public, I'll, let, I'll point out that it is on the city website under the agendas uh, for you to go there. Councillor Culhane, I'll recognize you if you can please unmute yourself. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just want to point out that the situation on Bay Drive is becoming urgent enough that I've heard from two of the of the residents down there, and they're doing a lot of talking among themselves. 
that the parking is now on both sides of Bay Drive and their concern is that, uh, you know, emergency equipment fire truck couldn't get down there. So um, I hope there's some urgency when this goes to the transportation committee to, uh, to put it to the top of their agenda if they can. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyone else on this item? Seeing none, I'll call the question all in favor. It's carried. Item 7.2 is an April 15th, 2020 letter from Hastings Prince Edward Public Health. And the resolution is that the April 15th, 2020 letter from Hastings Public, sorry, Hastings Prince Edward Public Health in connection with carrying out mosquito larviciding activities to prevent or control West Nile virus in our area, if deemed necessary, be supported and approved. Let's get this on the floor. Uh, moved by Councillor Sanderson, seconded by Councillor McCaw. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? It's carried. And then item number 7.3 is a May 4th, 2020 letter from the Victoria Victorian Order of Nurses. And the resolution is that the May 4th, 2020 letter from the Victorian Order of Nurses requesting to light the Belleville sign and Bridge Street Bridge blue for uh, Vaughn week, uh, May 18th to 23rd, 2020 be received. Get this on the floor. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Sanderson. Uh, any discussion on this? Councillor uh, Thompson, are you trying to get my attention there? <laughs> Can you activate your microphone and uh, I'll recognize you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a great request. And this is really why we got, you know, the sign here and the on the on the bridge also. So in that, I would like to, it says to receive it. I would like to move it and approve it. Well, receive I'd ask you to, we'll still receive it. And I think I'd ask you to stay tuned to the announcement section of today's meeting. Okay. And if I you're do. not happy with the outcome at that portion, I'll recognize okay. you for a motion then, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, welcome. Anyone else for discussion on this item? All right, I'll call the question all in favor. It's carried, thank you. Uh, now we have a motion to go into committee of the whole to hear and consider reports, passing of recommendations and resolutions with myself in the chair. I need a mover and a seconder, moved by Councillor Culhane, seconded by Councillor Carr. All in favor, it's carried. So under reports, the agenda shall include under reports items that warrant individual attention from council. And the first one is uh, item 8A1, a suspension of fireworks bylaws during COVID-19 gathering restrictions. Uh, Director of Fire and Emergency Services, Fire Chiefs Report Number FES 2020-05. And the resolution is that Council suspend Section 3.2.2 of Bylaw 9106, that being a bylaw for preventing of fires, spread of fire, and preservation of life and property, and item number three of Schedule A of Bylaw 2011-180, that being a bylaw to regulate noise within the City of Belleville, and that this suspension remain in effect until such time as the province of Ontario rescinds public gathering restrictions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's get this on the floor. I need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor McCaw, seconded by Councillor Sanderson. Uh, thank you. Any discussion on this? Councillor Carr, if you want to activate your microphone, and I'll recognize you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Panchuk. Um, I won't be supporting the, the recommendation. Um, correlation does, does not necessarily mean causation. And our, our concern has always been with the health emergency is that uh, we monitor gathering. And people can gather for a variety of reasons. They can gather for a barbecue. They can gather for a drink. Uh, they can gather for a special event such as Mother's Day. They can gather together because it's a long weekend. The point being is, is the public's been educated on uh, gathering and numbers. And my concern is that we've taken this COVID-19 health issue and we're starting to exert beyond the health measures. And it's been quite clear as to uh, what public health has been educating the public on in terms of uh, not gathering. And that's the, the premise behind this recommendation. The fact of the matter is, is that as we see things proceed, things are canceling all the time. Large group activities, um, more sports for children is being uh, canceled as we go along into the spring here. 
And so here we have an opportunity where we're probably not going to have any large community uh, fireworks of any sort. Um, but as a correspondence uh, that was received uh, from mystical distribution, the, the small consumer buying the product in order to fire off some fireworks in the backyard for the kids because there's nothing else going on doesn't seem unreasonable. And you could say that uh, if you buy fireworks, you're going to gather a crowd, but you could also say that uh, um, you're going to have a barbecue and, and gather a crowd. Or if you have a pool, you could gather a crowd. Those, those don't necessarily all relate to a health issue. And so I'm just concerned that um, government tries to do overreach beyond which the health measures are calling for. The public health has been very clear. And so uh, I can't support it. I think for the the small consumer who wants some for their backyard uh, in order to celebrate uh, Canada Day or any other event, I think is reasonable. And uh, just like every other decision that our public has been making along the way, our statistics prove that um, uh, physical distancing is working. Um, our, our, we are considered a low risk area based on the statistics that are there. And so if, uh, if a family wants to buy some fireworks for their backyard, I don't see that as being a problem and certainly is not going to cause an issue from a, a, from a health perspective. All right, thank you, Councillor Carr. I'm gonna ask uh, Chief Mark McDonald, the author of the report uh, to speak to, uh, to it. Um, Councillor Carr gave a number of uh, items that were his concern and you may or may not want to uh, address that Chief McDonald, but um, perhaps if you can talk about why this bylaw is coming forward to us at this time, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, certainly through the chair uh, to Councillor Carr. Um, th this issue uh, was brought up to the province probably about a month ago from the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs uh, because there was a lot of uh, concern about uh, public gatherings and about uh, being perceived as promo promoting uh, public gatherings. And uh, at that time, the Solicitor General said that it would be up to the municipalities to decide how best to control uh, public gatherings. Um, many municipalities in the province have passed uh, similar bylaws, many in the GTA and, and the Niagara region as examples, as large examples. Um, and the, the at issue is um, we were contacted by several of the distributors uh, and resellers um, because they wanted direction because they were going to need to order uh, supplies and stock and uh, some of them uh, mentioned to us that there was a uh, business uh, interruption insurance implications uh, if if we if we weren't permitting it it would they would be able to invoke certain sections of whatever type of insurance coverage they had so they just want a clear direction as the resellers before they went and ordered stock and set up their shops as they do uh, near the long weekends in Belleville um, every summer and certainly uh, you know I, I can completely agree that uh, when people have been, I'll say, cooped up as long as they have, it's fantastic if families can at least enjoy something that, that has some resemblance of normalcy uh, during the holiday periods. Um, one challenge that we have is if you look at the fireworks bylaws is it's very difficult for most residential properties in the city to, to meet the setback requirements. And it's also forbidden to light in parks and, and public spaces uh, on municipal property. So uh, I think the bigger picture was the commercial fireworks, uh, which Mystical is a great employer in the area, and they do both commercial and consumer uh, rated fireworks, is uh, those companies wanted direction uh, on, on how Bell was going to proceed. So this report has been brought forward for Council's consideration today uh, so that I can provide direction back to those suppliers and resellers, whether or not they can, it's worth their while to come and, and set up in Belleville during the holiday periods. All right, thank you very much, Chief McDonald. Uh, further questions or comments? I see you, Councillor Kelly. You wanna activate your microphone and I will uh, recognize you now. Go ahead. Oh, you went back to mute. Need to do it again. You're back on mute, Councillor Kelly. We can go ahead. Can you hear me now? I can hear you thank now. You, Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Just my thoughts on it uh, with the fireworks and uh, when we got the package, I reached out to Mystical Distribution in Trenton, uh, Mr. Phillips, and just talked. And I know we were all privy to an email today, uh, but some of my notes from uh, Mr. Phillips have been around for 18 years in the Quinney Area 30 in the uh, business. 
Um, COVID-19, like every other business in the country, it's really affected them. Uh, they normally employ about 30 people, uh, 30 in Trenton that uh, are locals here from Belleville that work there, 20 out West. And normally too, at Mystical, they hired 25 students for summer employment. And if you're a student looking for work, uh, you know how tough it is. Uh, with the cancellation of fireworks at festivals, many communities are shutting down. For example, Canada Day, they've lost some serious business. And uh, there's two types of fireworks. There's a the professional that we see at the big parks, and then there's the uh, smaller ones that people have in their own backyard. We're going into week nine, 10 now, social distancing. Uh, families have been cooped up, as Councillor Carr has indicated, and uh, they wanna have some fun. And they've done it in the past. And I asked Mr. Phillips, how, what, what's the safety standards for these fireworks? Well, his product is tested regularly by the Government of Canada, that's the Explosive Regulatory Division, ERD. They have strict safety standards. He told me that Canada has the strictest safety standards in the world. And they're designed when the sparks go in the air, when they're on their way down, they're burning out. So uh, limited chance uh, to have a fire. Talk about the noise level. It's equivalent to those driving in the neighborhood blowing their horn. Um, I know it's a form of entertainment. It's some fun for a family. Uh, families have been res respecting the social distancing. Um, we just went through Mother's Day weekend and we didn't see our bylaw officers or police departments shuttering, uh, shutting down gatherings. And I think for the most part, the residents of Belleville are responsible and they get what we've been preached to for the last 10 to 12 weeks to uh, work with COVID-19. And another thing I wanted to mention too, if the city could work with fireworks distributors and put a time limit in on these long weekends that it has to be done by 10 o'clock at night. So we know that the city has restrictions and this is really tough. A corner store in Belleville could make on an average Victoria Day weekend or long weekend in May, they could sell $5,000 of profit, profits. So um, we have to look after the small business. I feel it's totally safe after my conversation with Mr. Phillips and uh, I can't support a ban on fireworks um, in the city of Belleville. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else uh, discussion on this item? Um, Councillor Thompson, I'll recognize you and then Sanderson and then Williams, if I can ask you, okay, you're ready to go, sir. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, question to the fire chief. Does, um, with the displays kept at a bare minimum, um, and I presume the fireworks sold for home recreational is much different than the big fireworks. So as the fire department, any real concerns with it being uh, used as a small local uh, fireworks display? So I'll ask Chief McDonald to activate his microphone. And go ahead, sir. Yes, through the chair to Councillor Thompson. The, the residential or consumer grade, as Councillor Kelly mentioned, is, is a far uh, less powerful uh, explosive because that's really the act they fall underneath than, than the, the, com the commercial rate of the professional series, ones that they, they refer to as mortars. Um, the, every year, um, you know, we will usually respond to a few uh, what I'll call concerned uh, citizen calls that, that fireworks are going off, not so much from the family, uh, maybe that's doing it in the backyard, but maybe other people have gotten hold of them and decide that 3 a.m. is a better time to launch fireworks while, while walking down the street or something like that. So we, we will respond to nuisance calls uh, for fireworks pretty much every holiday weekend. Um, they, they don't generally uh, lead to, you know, large fires or that matter. It's more just, uh, just uh, hijinks going on maybe with people that have bought them for for nefarious reasons rather than uh, than civic celebration. The the issue with the, uh, you know, simply why the report was brought forward was to make sure from a, a messaging point of view that we were just staying uh, in step with what the, uh, the province was suggesting about uh, limiting uh, social or public gatherings to less than to five or less. So 
uh, we just wanted to make sure that neighbors weren't starting to want to, to uh, meet up in, in a central backyard, which is quite common. It's, it's not uncommon for streets to sort of pick a central backyard in a street and the whole gang of say 10 or 12 houses comes to that house and enjoys fireworks. So we just wanted to make sure that wasn't uh, going to be happening. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Okay, um, next Councillor Sanderson, if you wanna activate your microphone and I'll recognize you. you, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. Question for uh, Chief McDonald. You mentioned earlier that there's a setback. You know, what is the setback on a residential property? All right, Chief McDonald. Uh, yes, through the chair to Councillor Sanderson. It, it talks about, it, it speaks to safety. It, it, uh, it, it When it involves long-term care homes, certain types of what we call class B occupancies, it's, it's I believe the bylaw says 500 feet. And then there's other setbacks of, of, uh, of 100 feet. Um, it sort of has always overarched traditionally how we've approached it uh, from the fire department is, is we have setbacks in the burn bylaw. And, and those, are, those are there for that for the same reason is that you don't want the fire to get out of control or to expose uh, cinders and heat to, to, to structures nearby or, or other homes. So, okay, so do, those, do those setbacks uh, prohibit people from uh, using, uh, using their backyard for fireworks? When it comes to uh, our historically, what we've had is in very, uh, in the smaller lots in the city, uh, invariably what will happen is if if a person decides to set off uh, fireworks uh, and a they haven't invited their neighbors or the neighbors aren't aware it usually ends up to a call to uh, to the fire department or police department a complaint about fireworks being too close to their property and and they didn't feel safe we historically we have not had uh, large fires as a result of of fireworks in backyards okay so so based on some of the comments that I've heard earlier, uh, I too think that uh, given the circumstances that we're all under, uh, allowing people some enjoyment with, with fireworks, uh, it seems reasonable. And I think uh, as Councillor Carr said, uh, you know, people are, are certainly very well educated on social distancing. So, so I, I really don't have a concern. I, I think we should, uh, uh, allow the, the businesses to continue to, to operate and sell and uh, people to use these fireworks. Thank you, Councillor Sanderson. Uh, Councillor Williams, if you want to activate your microphone. And I will recognize you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. And, uh, and my comments would echo a lot of the same. Um, I'm wondering, Chief McDonald, the, the companies that had asked for the, I guess, the, the policy because of uh, business interruption insurance, are they from out of town, all those companies, or were they local? convenience stores or whatnot? Are they the ones that would set up uh, outside of Moore's clothing and sell sometimes? Or where did where were those coming from? Chief McDonald? Yes, through the chair to Councillor Williams. The the ones I'm familiar with were what I call the the, uh, the nomadic distributors that come in on holiday weekends and they, they, they'll drop a shipping container or a trailer and they'll put a staff person in there for the week before. Uh, the holiday weekend uh, to sell. So they usually, there's some big distributors um, and resellers that probably Mystical actually supplies uh, and they go province wide. So they were reaching out to many municipalities across the province, just looking for direction because I think they wanted to be able to order their stock for this coming season. Okay. Uh, and thank you for that. And, and I do echo my colleagues, um, you know, just hearing from Mr. Phillips and, and knowing that we have a business in the area that depends on revenue um, what I would recommend if I could, um, you know, if this gets defeated is that, can we educate the public one on, on, on fireworks safety um, and, and working with mystical for an example, but two on just again, reiterating our, our social distancing rules that we, uh, you know, I think uh, when we talk about property setback, Thurlow has a, a lot of properties that would be able to do this and enjoy it. But I think if we, focus on the positive aspects that you know the fire department is here to help it's not just here to, to put a fire when things go wrong it's that this can be safe and we are promoting uh, a, a you know in this crisis a fun aspect uh, that comes from a local business uh to me i i see no problem with that um i think the more the better uh, at this point so but uh, if, if we can do that that'd be great thank you sir thank you councillor williams uh councillor millet did i see you raise your hand earlier did you want to have say anything on this? If you can activate your microphone, if you do. 
what I have. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just going to uh, add my voice to the chorus. Uh, I, I, uh, I've spoken to uh, at least three uh, small retailers in my area, uh, just asking about the, uh, the impact of this on them uh, over the weekend and uh, um, to the point where I, I can't remember, was I may have been Councillor Carr who said that they, they, make a, they can make as much as 5,000 uh, in profit. But anyway, regardless, I don't wanna see this uh, bylaw in any way, shape or form harm an already uh, battered uh, mom and pop corner store um, uh, market. Those people are facing enough of a challenge right now. So unfortunately, while I understand the intent of this, uh, this regulation from the teeth, and I'm fully cognizant of the fact that it may, in fact, draw crowds, uh, uh, the impact on some of the small retailers and on the, uh, on the, uh, the manufacturer, local manufacturer himself is just too great. So I, I won't be supporting it at this time. All right, thank you, Councillor Millett. Uh, any other discussion? Councillor Colhane, if I can get you to activate your microphone. And I'll recognize you, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just through you to Chief McDonald, I appreciate the report and I appreciate the, the thought and the mindset that, uh, that uh, brought it forward. But I'm, I'm also very sympathetic to the impact on small business, especially the corner store dealers. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, sorry, but not going to support this. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no other uh, discussion, I'll call the question. So the motion on the floor is to approve these, uh, this, this report. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is defeated. Uh, moving on to item number 8A2, a single source request purchase four sets of hydraulic extraction combination tools and rams. And it's the Director of Fire and Emergency Services, Fire Chiefs Report Number FES 2020-04. Resolution is that in accordance with Section 30.3, sole and single sourcing, approval and reporting of the City's purchasing bylaw number 2020-09, the quotation from Code 4 Fire and Rescue be accepted for the supply of four hydraulic extraction combination tools and four hydraulic rams in the amount of $125,960 plus $16,374.80 HSD for a total amount of $142,334.80 and that the mayor and city clerk be authorized to assign the acceptance agreement on behalf of the Corporation of the City of Belleville and that the city clerk be authorized to affix the corporate seal. Let's get this on the floor. I move, uh, Councillor Carr, seconded by Councillor McCaw. Um, Chief, do you want to say anything to this? Pretty straightforward report. I'll, I'll, uh, if you want to maybe uh, talk about um, what exactly these items are mostly used for. If you want to activate your microphone, I will recognize you now. Sure. Thank you to the chair, to, uh, to, to all of council for your benefit. Uh, th this is the, uh, what, what you commonly know as the jaws of life, uh, that what we call heavy hydraulics uh, in, in the response business. Um, and it's used to obviously uh, extricate people uh, from motor vehicle accidents, but it can also be used for structural collapse, um, for, for moving uh, heavy, heavy uh, objects uh, to gain access to trapped persons or to shore up um, a collapsing uh, wall in the case of protecting someone who might be in an impingement uh, and need to be rescued or extracted from uh, from that position. Uh, these uh, our first Hearst hydraulics were actually uh, date back to the mid 70s. Um, and then in the late 80s, uh, when we got our first rescue van for the city of Belleville, the uh, at that time, the Knights of Columbus did a fundraising drive and we bought um, another set of, of the Jaws of Life. And in fact, that set is still in service to this day. So these, these are very robust, um, heavily made uh, pieces of equipment that exert uh, tons and tons of force to move um, metal and steel and, and other objects out of the way to save people. What we're, what we're finding with the new generation of vehicle for the past few years is the high strength steels they're using in new automobiles are designed to make the automobile lighter yet stronger. 
and where automobiles used to be full framed now they're made in what's called unit body construction uh, and they're designed with collapse zones generally speaking front and rear and then there's a safety cell where the passengers are located that's of this very high strength overlapped uh, steel and the challenge with this steel and some can be uh, boron or molybdenum but the real challenges are shears that used to cut the metal in the past when it was standard cold rolled steel and tempered steel is it could actually cut it. So we used to actually call them, and they're still referred to as you see in the report, cutters. But in fact, the new high strength steels are so strong that the cutters had to be redesigned because these steels don't cut, they have to be torn. So the tips on the new, uh, the new rams and, or the new hydraulics are actually made with titanium, which is, uh, which is a very strong, probably the strongest metal on the planet. Uh, and these uh, next generation, um, what it really provides for us is, is complete portability and rapid deployment. So the traditional equipment we have now has hydraulic pumps powered by gasoline engines that have to be carried to the scene. And then there's uh, long lines that are connected uh, to the tools. And then the tools are hooked up hydraulically, just like uh, traditional hydraulic systems. This uh, ties up a number of people and, and also uh, leads to a lot of equipment needing to be moved about. The new series of tools are essentially still a hydraulic tool, but they've actually moved to a high technology, I'll say the Tesla version of, 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 of uh, extrication tool that has a high capacity battery. And so they're completely portable. They operate exactly as the old tools do. So there's a familiarity for staff to understand the, the, the nuances of the controls to make sure that we don't accidentally move it in the wrong direction at the wrong time but it gives the portability. And this generation of tools is actually the most absolute newest in the sense that it's, they're also completely watertight. So they will operate submerged, which we've, we've never had a tool like this before. So they're used in, in hundreds of fire departments across, across Canada and in the States. And uh, the reason for the single source is we've been using Hearst for many years. We did evaluate three different manufacturers and what staff came back to overwhelmingly was that the Hearst was, was what they felt the most comfortable with and what they're most familiar with and did the job the best for them. All right. Thank you very much, Chief, for that information. Um, anyone have any questions or comments on this item? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move to Section 8B of the agenda, consent items. Council may adopt consent items by one motion, but prior to consideration of such motion, members may request that specific items be removed from consideration under such motion, and council shall consider such items individually. So I'm gonna go around the screen here. I'm gonna go from the way the, the screen is uh, set up on my uh, camera. Uh, Councillor Millette, any items you'd like to see removed? Councillor Millette, go ahead. No, sorry. No. No, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Culhane, uh, no. do you have any items that you'd like to see removed? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McCaw, any items that you'd like to see removed? No, thank you. Councillor Carr, any items that you'd like to see removed? No, thank you. Councillor Thompson, any items that you'd like to see removed? No, oh, thank you. Councillor Sanderson, any items that you would like to see removed? Uh, no, thank you. Councillor Williams, any items that you would like to see removed? No, thank you. Councillor Kelly, any items that you'd like to see removed? I, sorry, you have to activate your microphone. Go ahead, sir. You know, you're really struggling today, Councillor Kelly. No, with your, thank you. <laughs> if we have to have another electronic meeting, maybe I'm going to have you come uh, sit six feet away from me so that we can get this. No, listen, I'm just joking with you because I know that you... Uh, you can take it. Uh, this is all very new to us, and I hope that members of the public understand just how uncomfortable we all are with this format. But uh, our staff are doing a great job as best we can, and uh, I appreciate it. So um, the uh, motion will be that the uh, that all of the items be approved, and I need a motion for that. Moved by Councillor Carr, seconded by Councillor Kelly. All in favor? It's carried. Okay, so we'll move now to council information matters. And we have um, uh, one, two, uh, three items um, and I'll go around and if maybe you can just give me a head nod um, up and down or raise your hand if you have any items that you'd like to see pulled. Uh, Councillor Millett wants to pull something. Uh, go ahead, sir. 
Yes, uh, 8C5, Your Worship. 8C5. Uh, we only have two items under the 8Cs. Am I missing something? So you're looking for 8C2, one of those items, Councillor Millett? You need to activate your microphone, sir. 8C2A. A, okay, no problem. Thank you. Sorry, 8C2B, on page 8C5. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Culhane. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I also wanted uh, 8C2B. So 2B, okay. Cool. Councillor McCaw? Nothing. Councillor Carr? No. Uh, Councillor Thompson? No, they've already no, okay. been picked. Thank you. Councillor Sanderson? Nothing. Councillor Williams? Same, 8C2B. Okay. Councillor Kelly? No, good. Uh, so the agenda that the following agenda items be received, save and accept for item 8C2. Moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor uh, Culhane. Uh, all in favor, it's carried. Uh, 8C2B is a request that the province makes substantial investments in high speed internet connectivity in rural areas. It is an April 28, 2020 resolution from the Township of Armour. Uh, Councillor Millett is going to move, seconded by Councillor Culhane. Councillor Millett, I'll recognize you for discussion. Need to activate the microphone. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Your Worship. I was actually speaking to the uh, Hamilton motion. So uh, I think it was Councillor Cohane on okay. the high speed so, internet. And again, we're this has been difficult. So let's let's deal with 8C2A then. Um, uh, Councillor Millett is moving it, seconded by Councillor Cohane. Go ahead, Councillor Millett, on 8C2A. The request from the provincial government extend authority to municipalities to enforce enforce odor and lighting complaints stemming from licensed and unlicensed cannabis cultivations within its jurisdiction. It is a resolution from the city of Hamilton. You have the floor, sir. Activate your microphone, please. I need you to activate your mic. No, oh, I don't know. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Won't yeah. we be, it was, remember how hard it was to keep track of the microphones? Remember how hard it was just to yeah, get back in the mic before? This is a whole... Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry. Yes. Uh, this may seem like a rather uh, harmless motion, uh, but in fact, it gives peace and it gives a little bit of, uh, of protection to municipalities at the Rural Municipalities Association Conference in January. I sat in on a session. non-complying uh, grow operations. They may be legal with a Health Canada license, and uh, uh, but they're in, in no way complying. They don't, uh, they slow municipal uh, bylaws in terms of building permits and the like. Uh, Quinty West right now is dealing with two cases, I believe, of uh, grow operations that are technically operating uh, under license to Health Canada. They're, they're supposedly an approved grow up but are in fact uh, floating municipal laws. This motion gives just one little bit more protection to municipalities and, and the warnings that were issued uh, by municipalities, including uh, the small uh, municipality of Pelham down in the Niagara Peninsula, the mayor there said that they are dealing with just a nightmare scenario of uh, unregulated uh, grow operations uh, with all manner of of ensuing problems that go with them. So this is in no way intended to be an anti-pot uh, uh, motion by any means, but some way uh, that allows us as municipalities to have some control over how and where they operate and in what manner. So I'm, uh, I'm asking that we support this motion, uh, the city of Hamilton, and uh, I think some of my colleagues may want to speak on it as well. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councillor Millette. Anyone else on this item? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? 
The motion is carried. Now we'll move to 8C2B, which is the request that the province make substantial investments in high speed internet connectivity in rural areas. And again, this is the April 28th, 2020 resolution from the Township of Armour, and it's moved by Councillor Millette, seconded by Councillor Culhane. Councillor Millette, if you want to activate your microphone, I will recognize you to speak to the motion. Go ahead. There we are. Actually, uh, this, actually, sorry, this is Council, the one Councillor Culhane uh, wanted to speak on. I, uh, I spoke okay. out of turn, but I do support the, uh, the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Culhane, if you want to activate your microphone, I'll recognize you now. Go ahead. Thank Go you, ahead. Your Worship. Purely for the listeners, this is a motion uh, that the province makes substantial investment in high-speed internet connectivity in rural areas. And the letter that we received from Armour Township from Councillor Ward uh, summarizes the difficulties that people in rural areas have with poor connectivity. And they say, and I agree, high-speed connectivity cannot be seen as a luxury or a nice to have any more than hydro should be. The wise investment is providing connectivity for every resident in the province. And with the increased demand on internet and so many people using the internet and working from home, it must make it very difficult in the rural areas and it can't get anything but worse. So um, I'm asking that we support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Culhane. Anyone else like to speak on this item? Councillor Williams and then Councillor Sanderson. Thank Councillor you. Williams, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Your Worship. And I think just to, to, to add to, to Councillor Culhane's comments, I think we're seeing during COVID and, and especially with homeschooling uh, and, and around not just in, in rural areas, all over uh, Ontario and Canada, the need for high speed internet. I know the federal government has put a substantial amount of money into these programs. I know that uh, I guess we're asking the province to just to add on that and work, I think, as they do collaboratively, as collaboratively as they can, just to make sure this is a thing. I will just state from several residents and also from myself, um, just being out of the city, um, what I've noticed lately is 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 the phones are actually working quite well, um, you know, using wireless networks. I would just add if there was ever a point we could as a city make comments on this. I think uh, infrastructure that's not just broadband, but into wireless technology seems to be something that is actually going to work in rural areas uh, quite effectively without having what they say the, the hardest part of, of putting rural internet is what they call the last mile. So that's that last uh, little bit of road that gets from a post or a cable or a DSL to a home. Uh, wireless, as I've seen and I've heard, and I've been speaking to quite a few people, seems to be working quite effectively, uh, 5G or not. Uh, it is working in these wireless. The problem we have with a lot of cell phone companies and coming out with COVID right now, and a lot of families who can't afford it is data and it's overcharging in data from their phones. Uh, perhaps if we had strategies that, that were at least, if we were able to have some comments would add to look at supplementing uh, residents in their data charges if they had to use cell phones for wireless, cell phone connect connectivity for, for uh, internet. I think that would be something that would be, that would be probably a little more cost effective, but probably something that would be useful. So just my two cents, uh, hearing that from residents and knowing through myself, um, using data uh, on cell phones as, as that technology gets better. Um, I've seen it where people are running Netflix, a couple computers, a couple uh, iPads and their phones from just data from these wireless networks. So that's something of the future. Uh, and just uh, just a brief note on that for future comment. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Sanderson, uh, if you want to activate your microphone, I'll recognize you. you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. So uh, high speed uh, internet in the rural uh, section of Ontario specifically, has been a screaming need for the least, uh, at least a decade. And uh, over the course of the last year and a half, uh, maybe even two years, we've had federal announcements of money. We've had provincial announcements of money. We uh, most recently had uh, the Eastern Ontario Regional Network uh, take on the procurement uh, of uh, expanding uh, internet into rural Ontario and specifically in our region, particularly. So what we need, I, you know, I, I don't have any problems supporting this letter, but what we really need is we need the 
installation and deployment schedule for the monies that have already been committed. I think the, uh, the, the number that comes to mind is I think 218 million uh, that uh, was earmarked for Eastern Ontario region. So, so I, I, guess, uh, I guess it's a bit of a long-winded uh, way of saying I, I can support the letter, but I, I don't think the letter is gonna provide uh, the benefit that we're really looking for, which is instead of, instead of just telling us you're going to install it or telling us how much money you've committed to it, show us the deployment schedule that shows me where are these 300 towers, I think is the number, that we're going to be deployed. You know, when are we going to install the first one? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor uh, Tom uh, Sanderson. Uh, Councillor Kelly, I see you, and then Councillor Carr. So if you want to activate your microphone, Councillor Kelly, um, you have to activate your mic, sir. There you go. There you now go. You go ahead. Me. Yes. All right. Through you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, I'll support the letter going to uh, the provincial government. Um, I just wanted to make some thoughts on, uh, we talk about investment in, in technology and we've seen it now with COVID-19 and as Councillor Williams touched on, particularly with uh, school students in rural Ontario, um, and you don't have to go too far out of Belleville uh, to get to rural Ontario. I've noticed for years, what I've done, what I do for a profession, I keep track of stuff. And uh, there were investment announcements for infrastructure for broadband uh, in Belleville, Center Hastings, North Hastings, back when Harper was the prime minister. And it was millions of dollars. And that was under MP uh, Cramp. And then MP Basio comes in, Trudeau, and they're making announcements after announcements after announcements. I sit on EMS. Uh, for Hastings County. And we have police, ambulance, and fire can't get into certain sections once you get past Madoc with cell reception. As Councillor Sanderson touched on, um, there's been millions of dollars invested. It looks like we haven't had any results. We come back, that's all we hear about is broadband, how much service they got to work on the service. I'm willing to guarantee if we pull up some old press releases, there's millions of dollars invested and they talk a great game, but it's not happening. And now with COVID-19, we see where we're sh falling short. Um, let's send a letter, but it's 2020, as fast as we want to get through this year. Uh, those folks in rural Ontario that continue to struggle with internet and proper access. This has been a message from the feds and the province for the last 10 or 15 years. And it seems to be no better today than it was in 2008. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Carr, if you want to activate your microphone, I'll recognize you, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And certainly this is a, a drum that uh, I've been beating for a while. I met uh, with former MP Mike Bossio on Parliament Hill in 2018 and uh, early in 2018. And then a couple of councillors, uh, Sanderson and Kelly, have referred to it as well. There was a Connect to Innovate announcement back in July 2018, right here in Corbyville. And it was uh, $10 million from the federal government, $20 million from ExploreNet. And it talked about building hubs. So there was towers, as, uh, as Councillor Williams referred to. And then from there would branch out uh, into small pockets uh, using fiber optics. And uh, we were told at that announcement that at least as far as rural Belleville goes and even rural Hastings County goes and even rural Eastern Ontario goes, that this would be the solution. And uh, interestingly enough, and Councillor Sanderson touched on it, the one thing that we don't see is the timeline and we don't see the deliverables. I think the one thing that we have going for us now is we have MPPs, and particularly MPs doing what we're doing here today, trying to connect and conduct business, and they're finding that they can't do that. Um, there's going to be significant uh, pressure on the Ministry of Education, in particular in the provincial government to come up with a plan. Um, I don't think the days of uh, homeschool or the days of online learning are over. Um, even if uh, schools go back, I can see a graduated 
or a staggered process where it's going to be a combination of both. And so I think in the end that uh, the people that are making the decisions that are allocating these millions of dollars are experiencing some of the frustration that our constituents um, experience on a daily basis. I know that uh, since I've been on council uh, this, this time uh, and last term, that we hear it time and time again. And we have a lot of people who uh, telework and not just telework outside of the GTA, but we, I know so, some individuals in Thurlow that actually work for companies in the United States and the files that they have to transfer are enormous. And, uh, you know, so from that teleworking perspective, uh, I guess if anything that good can come out of a bad situation is that uh, we need to experience the bad part of the technology to look at where to improve. But I think what I would like to see, and I don't know if it's, uh, and, I, and I support this wholeheartedly, the more we pile on, the better. But perhaps maybe uh, the mayor could send a letter to uh, the member of parliament and just get a timeline on some of these things, just an idea of deliverables. I know that there's been some, uh, even on social media, I know Mayor Panchuk, there are a couple constituents in Thurlow that have reached out about it and, and asking us to take, uh, take a lead on it. Um, so I certainly support the motion, but I think we need to ask the questions of when are we actually gonna see the deliverables as, as Councillor Sanderson rightfully points out, because the announcements are great. And that uh, Connect Innovate announcement was to basically solve all of our broadband issues in uh, Eastern Ontario. And certainly Belleville would, would uh, have high speed internet right to the Northern border. And that hasn't been the case. And I don't even know how much work is being done. So I'll support the motion, but perhaps maybe a, a reach out to uh, our federal member of parliament and, and our local MPPs as well, just to get an idea of when some of this infrastructure might come forward. Thank you. Great, thanks. Anyone else uh, for discussion on this? Well, I have some information, maybe that'll help sort of with, with the discussion and uh, you know, following up on Councillor Carr's suggestion about um, a letter or to, uh, to take this forward. And you know, uh, for me, this has been a 12 year journey because I remember being on Parliament Hill as part of the Quinty Economic Development Commission delegation that went to Ottawa when Mr. Cramp was uh, in a minority government at that time and they were dealing with the McGuinty government provincially, where that was the first steps of recognizing the, uh, the communication hole in Eastern Ontario when it came to wireless uh, telephone cellular service, as well as a uh, high speed uh, data. And, um, and I know it was a very difficult process to start, but they did get that going. And, um, and the, the Eastern Ontario uh, Warden's Caucus and the Eastern Ontario's Mayor's Caucus uh, have been pushing for this for I think it must be the last three mayors of the, of the city of Belleville and we have actually moved things along. Um, the Eastern Ontario Regional Network has been created, EORN it's called, they are taking the lead on supplying the equipment but I will go back to uh, something that was very interesting that was said by Councillor Kelly and Councillor Sanderson asking for all this money has been promised, where are the results? Well, the money has been promised, but it has not flowed yet. Because in our system of government, we have to have contracts uh, signed, you have to have RFPs released uh, before the money gets released by those federal and provincial governments. So successive governments have promised, and I would say in some cases, re-promised monies. Um, meanwhile, the Eastern Ontario Regional Network has been doing the preliminary work, all the prep work, uh, identifying the problem, figuring what the game plan is. Right now, there is a RFP out for the installation of these towers. Um, and once that is received and a decision is made to award the contract, only then will some of those funds uh, move forward. So it's not so much an issue of the fact that the money um, is, we're looking for more money. It's about the process to get things going. And I think, you know, one of the most positive things about this resolution is showing that the provincial government needs to um, expedite the process to get these contracts awarded so we can start with this work. Uh, and that's really important. So, um, you know, if I, if I also can talk about, Councillor Williams mentioned about the cell phone technology that now people are able to use the data on their telephones and it's working quite well. This is the whole philosophy behind the network that will be coming to our region in Eastern Ontario. It is going to be wireless Wi-Fi service based on towers. 
And, uh, and I think that in the same way now that we're finding that we can data share with our devices that we have in terms of hotspots and, and use them, that's the whole concept of it going forward. And it's actually going to be um, easier than the, the cable that's been, you know, the fiber optic cables that have been strung in the past that we're, we're seeing. So um, this, this issue is, is moving along. Um, I, I can say, and Councillor Carr, you, uh, I know that you will dislike this answer as much as I didn't like it when I heard it and Councillor Sanison, because we have people now who through the course of this COVID-19 are just seeing how uh, incapable our system is to keep up with the needs and, uh, and the future growth of our communities and our, our young people through education, but also people that are having to work from home. And, um, and so as we've tried to um, determine an exact date of when we can expect the service to be extended to our community, uh, the date right now I'm hearing is 2025. So another five years, uh, depending on where the services are going, but this whole project will be completed within the next five years. And that may include uh, Belleville sooner or at the very end, but 2025 is the, is the end of that. Um, the one thing I do try to remind people, and because a lot of people believe this is just a problem in rural Belleville, um, that we have uh, everywhere else in the country, everywhere else in Ontario uh, is, dealing, is not dealing with this, just we are dealing with this. Unfortunately, this is a problem all across Ontario, all across the country, and even all across North America. There are many areas in, in, in the United States, in rural parts of the United States, that are experiencing the same problem, where they are having astronomical data bills, they have poor service, they have poor connectivity. And uh, you have to understand that the governments, we're not in the communications business. We're not the ones who decide where towers go and how they go. It's a market-driven uh, process and the market is being going to where it's at now. So um, the money is available, uh, it's been announced. Uh, the governments are going to honor their commitments for it. The city of Belleville and all municipalities in Eastern Ontario, we've actually paid our share as well into this. Um, this is not about the resources, it's not about needing more money, it's about needing it to happen faster. And I think this resolution is a good one, we'll move it forward. Um, and that our next uh, Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus meeting, I have committed to have uh, some of the residents, uh, either uh, if it's going to be electronic or in person, make a deputation to the Mayor's Caucus to talk about the, um, the, the negative consequences of having this poor uh, you know, uh, wireless and, uh, and, uh, and data information and how it's holding us back. So, um, you know, certainly I think we're going to vote, we're going to support this resolution. We're moving as fast as we can. We're pushing on it. Um, and I, uh, and if Councillor Carr, if you still believe that additional effort should be made to communicate to our federal and provincial uh, representatives uh, about this urgency, I'm all in, I'm all supportive of writing that letter. Anyone else have anything they would like to say or any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Next, we will rise and report. Can I get a motion to rise and report? Moved by Councillor Culhane, seconded by Councillor uh, Carr. All in favor? It's carried. We'll move now to the bylaws section of our agenda. And I'll read, uh, we'll do first reading of bylaws. I'll just read out the numbers. Bylaw number 2020-88. 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, and 98. Can I get a motion to um, approve those bylaws? Moved by Councillor Sanderson, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Uh, all in favor, motion is carried. Second reading of bylaws and discussion of bylaws number 2020-28, 20, 20 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, and 98. Does anyone like to discuss any of those bylaws? Councillor Thompson, if you wanna activate your microphone and I'll recognize you, the floor is yours. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, on, act, uh, on bylaw number 2028 um, is a bylaw for the, um, the parks. Just one question uh, in 2.8, it's a minor thing, but it talks about feeding the um, animals or birds down at um, any place in, in Belleville. My question is, um, I walk down at the uh, trail every morning and I notice people feeding the different animals. Um, I would request that if we're going to pass this, 
that we make sure there's signage down there to indicate to the people and try to hopefully discourage them from feeding them. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Manager Reed, who is here. We'll get you. Uh, we're going to bring you in from the waiting room, and. Okay, there he is. is. Well, um, Mr. Reed, go ahead. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Thompson. Uh, yes, we uh, part of the uh, whole discussion. There was some items that uh, like the fishing. Uh, we're going to make sure we post areas that uh, there are areas that you want to not have people feeding things. Uh, primarily, you know, the turtle pond and so forth. Um, as you can appreciate, pre appreciate the geese downtown or down along the waterfront, we don't want them being fed and so forth. So we will put some signage up. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Reed. I just, I notice it quite regularly morning, in the mornings, sometimes even in the afternoon when I go for another walk, I see quite a few people feeding uh, the, the geese and that's certainly concerned because the more we feed them, the more they're gonna stay around. So signage is important to me, thank you. All right, anyone else on any of these bylaws? All right, there are a couple of bylaws. I'd like to just say a couple of words about, you know, going back to what Councillor Thompson just uh, raised regarding the new parks bylaw or the updated parks bylaw. Um, you know, we had uh, first reading of this bylaw last fall. We solicited feedback from the community. As you see from the report, uh, there was a fair amount of feedback from, um, uh, from, from people. And that information was then uh, dealt with by staff and our uh, legal counsel. Uh, you can see the uh, the points that were made regarding we have made some amendments taking in in uh, in light the comments made from members of the community there were also a number of other comments that were made that we are not making amendments to because um, of the the reasons why we need this bylaw so i'm i'm really happy and i want to thank uh, staff and our solicitor for going through all that uh, and i i'm very comfortable when passing this bylaw today I also want to note bylaw number 2020-95, and we had an announcement last uh, month uh, regarding the appointment of a new chief building official for the city of Belleville. I'd like to congratulate Brett Forrestall on his new position as the chief building official, and also want to congratulate Kevin Kehoe on his uh, promotion to the deputy chief building official for the city of Belleville. And I can tell you that um, over the past 10 weeks, the attention that's been on that department, um, as well as the um, flexibility that they have shown to allow the business of the city of Belleville uh, to continue with innovative and creative uh, ways has been very impressive. And I just want to, to recognize that, uh, you know, we have never had to uh, implement a provincial declaration of emergency orders where our staff were then uh, delegated by the province to help with the enforcement. Um, those, uh, those employees have been doing so under the direction of uh, the now chief building official, Mr. Forrestal. Uh, we have been working collaboratively with other municipalities so that we are consistently interpreting um, what is permitted to be uh, as activities in the city of Belleville. Um, but also, uh, you know, for example, today, um, you know, we've been able to allow pet grooming operations to go because we've interpreted the orders that they can be a retail business uh, and they can operate on the curbside uh, manner. and. You know, this is, uh, I think, uh, what we all as council uh, wanted to see in terms of a more um, open and business friendly environment where people are understanding things. So I, I want to, you know, provide um, my congratulations, but also recognize that uh, they have been doing a very, very good job. Um, you know, we, we didn't uh, discuss, but the building statistics for the month of April uh, really are only a week's worth of activity uh, because of the... Uh, uh, changes by the province and that it was spectacular to be able to do that volume of activity uh, in such a short period of time. And so um, I just wanted to recognize that. Uh, seeing uh, no other discussion, I will call the question on second reading of those bylaws. All in favor? It's carried. Uh, we'll now deal with third and final reading of bylaws number 2020-28, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, and 98. Moved by. Councillor uh, Culhane, seconded by Councillor McCaw. All in favor? It's carried. The next item is new business. And um, I have a couple things I'd just like to uh, discuss before we uh, open the floor up to Council. Um, 
first, I want to deal with uh, events in the city of Belleville. Uh, previously, we have, uh, we have uh, previously announced that all city events in Belleville were canceled until the end of May. Uh, today, we are also announcing that events will now be canceled up until the end of June 2020. No further decisions have been made for July and August, as we will get um, more information and be better prepared as a council to make this decision as we get closer to the summer months of July and August. Of course, we understand that many organizations may wish to cancel their events now um, uh, that are going to be happening later in the year, and we will continue to work with them. Uh, for example, last week, I received a telephone call from the owner of the Belleville Senators. Mr. Melnick wanted me to hear first that the American Hockey League would be canceling the remainder of the season, and that announcement was uh, made public earlier today. Season ticket holders will be contacted to make arrangements, including a full refund of the remaining amounts if they wish to, or they can apply it towards uh, the next season's tickets. I uh, thank Mr. Melnick for his generosity in paying uh, Senator's event staff for the remainder of the season and uh, what would have been the first round of the playoffs. Uh, we celebrate the best season we've ever had as the Belleville Senators um, as they finish in first place of their division. Um, and while the season is now ended, unfortunately, uh, we look forward to next season when we will continue to have a competitive team. Uh, I also received a letter last week from the Belleville Agricultural Society notifying us that they had to cancel the 2020 edition of the Quinty Exhibition and Fall Fair. Uh, this is truly unfortunate as one of the longest continually running fairs in all of Canada, but we understand completely. A lot of planning and work preparation goes into this type of event, work that has already been severely impacted by the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, we look forward to welcoming them, welcoming them back in 2021 for the 200th year of this organization and their fall fair. With respect to Chamber of Commerce events, particularly those that are contracted uh, to them on behalf of the City of Belleville, we continue to work with the Belleville Chamber of Commerce to determine the proper steps for the events they organize and provide our community on behalf of the City of Belleville. Uh, we continue to take steps day by day in our decision making process and we'll make announcements when we are ready regarding uh, the July and August uh, timeframe. Uh, with respect to bag tags and garbage pickup in the City of Belleville, uh, since the COVID-19 situation uh, first presented itself, we have tried to assist residents and businesses uh, to carry on with the necessities of life while promoting healthy behaviors. One of those steps was to not require residents to have to go to convenience stores or grocery stores or city hall to purchase bag tags to have their waste collected. I'm uh, pleased that a number of uh, purchases are now available. Residents can purchase a number of, of permits, including bag tags online through the City of Belleville website. Uh, in March and in the first 20 days of April, we collected up to 10 bags without tags. Uh, since April the 20th, we have limited this now to two bags per property. Today, I'm announcing that effective June the 1st, we will limit the number of bags without bag tags to one per property. And then on July 1st, we will only collect garbage with bag tags. Um, we know that these allowances over the past several weeks have been appreciated by our residents. And we also want to say a big thank you to the people who have collected our waste over the past eight weeks as they continue to provide this essential service. Again, to reiterate um, on effective right now, if you have up to two bags, we will collect without bag tags. Effective June the 1st, we will drop that number to one per property and effective July 1st, all bags will require tags. Um, we will continue to collect up to 10 bags per property if they have tags, but if you don't have a bag tag, again, uh, you have two bags right now to the end of the month, one for the month of June, and then you have to have bag tags on all bags starting July 1st. Um, I have uh, an item that I want to address that uh, I am, um, I, I, I don't really want to have to address, but I think it is important. Uh, COVID-19 has shown some of the best in people as our community has rallied to support each other. The financial and social repercussions of this pandemic has brought us together in so many ways, and we are committed to an economic recovery and supporting each other. I recognize that many individuals and businesses who are sacrificing in many ways, including financially, for our corrective survival. They are doing so because it is necessary for our great community and for our quality of life. 
But unfortunately, not everyone who makes a living in or from Belleville is stepping up to this collective duty. The Bellfront Shopping Centre at the corner of Bell Boulevard and North Front Street is a recent example that came to my attention of an individual who is not assisting during our time of need. I actually reached out to this landlord a couple of weeks ago to ask them to understand the crisis we are in. I also explained that the City of Belleville has provided relief to the landlord in the form of property tax deferral and that we expected this assistance would be passed on to their commercial tenants. I spoke to Ms. Petronella Ionescu about this matter on behalf of, the, of a tenant at the Bellfront Shopping Centre and what she told me in terms of developing an action plan for those, temp, those tenants is simply not occurring. Last week, several tenants were issued landlord's distress warrants by Davpart Incorporated and the owner, Mr. Bavish Chohan, through an out-of-town bailiff. I personally saw a number of these documents on the windows of these businesses who were required to close due to the provincial declaration of emergency. I can state unequivocally that I am disgusted by this action. Companies that do business in Belleville owe it to our community to assist us during these hard times. So many others are doing so, and a company like Davport, in, uh, Davport Incorporated is sticking out like a sore thumb because they are not. I am putting Davport Incorporated and the owner, Mr. Bavish Chowan, on notice that if they do not wish to be a good community member, then they should sell this property to ownership that does wish to be a decent community member. If you profit from us, we expect better. Now they still have time to change their actions towards their tenants and I encourage them to do so. We have residential tenant protections in Ontario and I have, I have spoken with MPPs Todd Smith and Daryl Cramp to ask for this protection for commercial tenants as well. And if any business in Belleville is experiencing difficulties with their landlord or financial institutions, please contact me. Contact me directly at 613-967-3267 so that I can try to help. We are committed to ensuring that the great quality of life in our community will be there again for us as we relax some of the restrictions necessary from COVID-19. We are all in this together, not just now, but also afterwards. We will remember those who have been who have been here for us. Does anyone else have any new business they'd like to uh, to raise at this point? Councillor Williams, if you want to activate your microphone, I'll recognize you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Worship. I have uh, two items tonight uh, this afternoon. One is on uh, pop-ups, and just wanted to give an update. Uh, what's happening on uh, Zwix? Um, I'm actually not sure, Mark, if you're going to let me screen share. And if you are, I'm just going to show this document real quick. And let's see if everyone can see that. So basically, uh, it's a meeting today, and this would come to council uh, later on down the road. But this just gives you an idea of what's happened with COVID-19 and the changes that staff have proposed. And you can see down at Zwix that uh, right now they've had 11 uh, applicants, and 11 are being proposed. Again, this comes back to council down the road. This is within the budget they do have. Um, and really, it's, uh, it's a broad mix of food trucks uh, and, and uh, a venture outfitter would do kayaks and support and, uh, and some other, some, a coffee shop and some other great uh, initiatives. And I think this is something that I commend staff for working hard on uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, again, based on, on what's happening and, and working with park staff and, and the city, this seems to be something that will work. Uh, they are working uh, closely uh, with these operators and with the, uh, again, listening to what's happening with the province, but working with uh, where parking is, uh, I've got which is washrooms and they'd have to have uh, different protocols for social distancing, but uh, it is something that's uh, going forward and looks uh, like they're doing a great job. Thank you. Great uh, to raise that, Councillor Williams. I know you have another item, but before you get to it, um, you know, and, and we've had some very good news with respect to water levels. And while we're not out of the woods yet in the sense of uh, some rain can also uh, cause us uh, some, some problems. Um, right now, we are uh, very much further ahead than we were last year. So uh, we are, um, you know, going to continue to to cross our fingers um, uh, about the water levels that will allow us to do this. And so when we can relax, some of the restrictions about going out, we'll be able to enjoy this waterfront uh, uh, development. Thank you for bringing this up today. Thank you. My second item. Um, 
really i've been i've been uh, on this since uh we first met uh i think all over the table all over the room <laughs> in march uh just really keeping an eye on our fiscal situation having as a counselor uh, a great grave concern as a business owner of just how we're going to get through uh, this crisis together how we're getting through this as a city uh, and our residents and keeping in mind uh, we have our best uh, the, the as the mayor stated the residents best interest at heart we want to make sure at the end of the day we're not seeing massive tax increases and we're really handling ourselves in a fiscally responsible manner it's really about retooling our municipality for another reality that social distancing is here to say and as all reports are stating right now in the economy that it seems like we are in the start of a recession. And I wanna be part of that council that is fiscal responsible. And I wanna thank staff this week. I've had a lot of uh, different questions for Mr. Bove and, and for Carol Hines on just how we're going to approach that. Uh, Ms. Hines has been great to give me some answers that uh, when it comes to staff and it comes to budgets for this year, uh, they've asked every single department for unprecedented cuts and their departments and how normally this ha happens operationally is we have uh, requests from staff, we put a budget together, it goes through a finance committee and then through to council. Um, I know that Carol has uh, indicated to me that they are working hard on this. What I'm requesting today um, is that we get a copy of the proposed 2020 revised budget, if necessary for council review only by the end of the week. I know that the next stage, it has to go through the finance committee. And I know that I would ask that committee meet as soon as it can. I know that chair is uh, Councillor Sanderson, um, but I would like as a councillor no later than the end of June to have met and reviewed and approved at least a preliminary budget. And that's really what I'm asking for today. And the reason for that is I know that we can make cuts and I think there's a lot of unknowns and, and Ms. Hines has been very gracious to let me know what she's dealing with. And I commend staff because they're, we're all in unprecedented times. But as a councillor, we're also responsible for these taxpayers and to our businesses, not only because I think we can look to be fiscally responsible and bring in a budget that hopefully comes close to a, a minimal increase as we can to taxpayers. But I think because there are some ways that perhaps we can help taxpayers as well. I know before this all started, we looked at uh, measures around housing and that's something that's still going to be a big problem. Um, another thing that's come across are, are some residents are looking for reduction of water rates. Are these things that we can look at for relief? I know that we've also done as, as the mayor has mentioned uh, bag tags, and we've helped in, in a lot of regards in deferral of taxes. But I think to be responsible to do it the right way, I would just ask if we can that we get a budget going as soon as we can. June 30th will be six months into a 12 month budget. And I think that's as far as I'm comfortable in going as a counselor. I just wanna ask that we, we go ahead as soon as we can, uh, get a, a budget to us so we can start looking at, I'll work together. We're all in this to help everyone else work on that and just to be able to bring this to council to have approval, even if we have to go back to it in the fall, that's how I'm gonna be comfortable as a counselor to uh, to make sure we're looking out for the citizens of Ottawa. Well, Councillor uh, Williams, if you'd like to do that, uh, I'm gonna require that you make a motion and if it is seconded, uh, then it'll have to pass um, under the new business threshold. Um, we've had, you and I had a conversation about this uh, last week on Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday and I appreciate you calling me. Um, I went through the reasons why I think it's premature for us to take those steps at this point. Um, but you have the right to bring this up at this point. And if you want to make a motion, and if there's a seconder, we can consider it. Otherwise, um, uh, you know, I can, I can speak to why uh, that's not a good idea. But I'll do that if there's a motion on the floor. I'm not going to make a motion to new business. But if that works, your worship, I'll make a notice to motion if that works for you. Yeah, you can do that under notice of motions. Uh, we can do that later on. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, you're welcome. Anyone else with new business items? Councillor Carr. Uh, Go thank ahead. You, Chuck. Um, just uh, as we're into our second uh, electronic meeting and uh, the planning advisory committee is meeting on May 18th uh, for their first inaugural meeting in this format. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, we are at a position where we can rescind the delegation of authority from the CAO or designate. Um, back on March 20th, we did that because we weren't sure if we could meet. Uh, the day before on March 19th, the Legislative Assembly of Ontario amended the Municipal Act to allow us to do what we're doing here today. Uh, on April 20th, we amended the procedural bylaw to allow us to do what we're doing here today. 
So since we're able to conduct council business at this level and planning will be up and activated on the 18th, uh, are we in a position to rescind that? Sure. Let me, I'm going to, we weren't expecting the question, so I don't know if council, if um, CAO Bove had, uh, has had a chance to think about it, but we um, delegated the authority to the chief administrative officer and the director of finance to take certain uh, prescribed actions. Um, as you said, quite rightly, because we did not know whether or not would we be meeting again and how we could meet. Um, Mr. Bove, um, I'm going to uh, activate, if you want to activate your microphone, uh, do you want to give us some, some thoughts of uh, what your feeling is uh, on that? I know it was for a period of 90 days, um, which was the original uh, delegation of authority. Um, so we are um, not to that 90 day period yet, but uh, what do you think about Councillor uh, Carr's suggestion? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you, Councillor Carr, I think uh, the file was for 90 days. Uh, I believe it does have a qualifier, you know, as unless changed by council, and I think with uh, council's ability to meet. Uh, now, and as Councillor Kerr indicated, the ability of the planning committee to now get started and continue with uh, their meeting on uh, May 19th, I believe it is. Uh, and then again, okay, so um, June I'm going to ask uh, uh, Director, or Director back McDonald to, uh, have if he has um, any comments have, uh, um, uh, with respect to the process that. that we would follow to rescind that uh, de that uh, delegation of authority. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. So the delegation of authority um, can be rescinded by uh, council uh, as at your leisure. Um, certainly it's uh, within your it's within your authority to do. You delegated um, the authority to the treasurer and CAO um, for those very specific duties as, uh, as you saw fit and that were requested uh, during the provincial um, declaration of emergency. Um, recognizing that the majority of you probably had some difficulty hearing the CAO, um, the reality is uh, that uh, we're now meeting regularly and we're resuming the statutory committee as Council Carr referenced. Um, I had a hard time hearing the CAO as well, um, but certainly uh, there have been very few instances where there's been the exercise of that authority uh, from a finance perspective. Uh, it's happened more um, with the routine planning uh, matters. Um, but as far as, as the mayor asked, mechanically, uh, the council can rescind that uh, very quickly and easily. And uh, mechanically, it's, it's more of a formality than anything else. Okay, thank you very much. So, Councillor Carr, um, if you want to reactivate your microphone, uh, you've heard. Um, I, I don't know if you heard all of what the CEO had said, but he basically said he's okay with it uh, because of the regular resumption of our of our meetings. Um, and then Director McDonald has talked about the fact that uh, it's up to us to decide to do it. Um, do you have a preference if we do it today? Or do you want to wait until the the next meeting of council is on March the 25th? I believe, or sorry, May the 25th. Uh, do you want to wait to that meeting, or what would you prefer to uh, to have happen? Well, so a couple things. Yeah, the CAO's uh, broadcast was uh, quite delayed, and and I and I didn't catch it at all. Um, but as long as I guess the thing is the the report from the city clerk was quite clear in terms of why we were delegating, and if we can be satisfied that uh, we can meet those obligations without that delegation, so perhaps maybe can I just request a staff report for the next meeting that would include a recommendation and then that would at least provide the rationale for council to consider because there were statutory obligations under the planning act as well as certain things we couldn't do financially because we weren't sure 
our frequency of meeting or how we were going to meet, even though we knew the legislation uh, was coming from the province. Um, for example, today we approved a sole source uh, uh, purchase yeah. uh, under the purchasing bylaw, which we are allowed to do as our, our authority. If we weren't able to meet, then that designated authority mm -hmm. would allow the CA to do just that. So what I'm looking for is, is to rescind that, not that, uh, you know, we don't want the CAO to take care of those things, but we are all here to govern equally. And if we can pull some of that back and continue on, as you have said before, with the city of business as per normal, as we've been conducting all the way along, I'd just like to see us transition back or, or uh, so a staff report with a recommendation of can we meet all those obligations? Because I believe there, I don't have the report up uh, in front of me, but there was a number of things that uh, they didn't think that we could accomplish, but if we can accomplish those or pull back some of that authority, that would be good. Okay, that's fair enough. So we'll have that for the next meeting. Uh, Director McDonald will have that uh, report for you um, and I uh, appreciate you bringing it up. Anyone else have anything under new business they wish to address? Uh, Councillor Thompson and then Councillor Sanderson. Go ahead, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Arthur. Um, just following up on Councillor Williams, um, on the, the budget, I, I sit on the, uh, the finance committee and, you know, it has been a concern of mine for some time. And I, matter of fact, I, uh, spoke to, I sent an email to Councillor Sanderson as the chair that we seem to be able to try to get it together, um, so that we have some idea where we're going. So I, I, I certainly, uh, respect that Ms. Uh, Councillor Williams wants something, he's going to maybe put it in a notice of motion. But I think we we, we are hiding in six months down into our budget. If we, at least the finance committee can have some sort of look at it um, through uh, the mayors on that committee, Councillor Sanderson, the chair of it. I think it's important that, that we sort of try to find out what it's cost us at this stage through this, what we're uh, maybe going to be short um, where some of our savings may be so that, you know, we can start to look at our budget, which we haven't approved yet, so that we can look at approving this budget sooner than later. And um, so that's my concern as part of the committee. And I think Councillor Sanderson's probably going to make a comment also, but I know as part of the committee, I would like to see some figures brought forward uh, sooner so that we can start looking at a budget that we can possibly approve. All right, thank you, Councillor Thompson. Well, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I would say that proceeding with a with finalizing our budget at this point is not a good idea because so much of what we need to know in order to do that is not available right now to us. And I'm speaking specifically about the programs and relief that the federal and provincial governments have promised municipalities and are being developed at this time. Everything in our society is affected financially because of the COVID-19 uh, revenue hole that I, that I spoke about. Last month, I recognized the work that upper levels of government have done to help with the crisis of liquidity in our economy while protecting people's health. The uh, CERB, uh, wage subsidies, commercial rent relief, and other assistance programs are essential in preventing what occurred during the Great Depression. And in the middle of all of this is where we sit today as a city. You know, but let's remember, we're not alone. Everyone's in the same boat waiting as upper levels uh, of government deal with this initial crisis so that they can then turn their attention to us and the assistance, as I said, that they have promised. They've asked us to be patient. I know that some of us want to show that we're dealing with our responsibilities and taking decisive action. But today and now is not the time. This is the time for us to demonstrate leadership and discipline especially when it goes against our national, our natural instincts of doing something. These past 10 weeks have been frustrating for those of us who want to do things and to be seen to be doing things, things that demonstrate financial responsibility. But while action at this time may make us as a council feel better, it's not the right thing to do. We should continue to manage our financial affairs just like we do each year prior to setting our budget, normally in April. Uh, Director Hines manages uh, continued operations based on the previous year's budget. When we have the information we need, we can then proceed with finalizing the 2020 budget. To do so now without knowing what we or how we will be receiving COVID-19 assistance 
would be pure speculation on our part. And I don't believe that would be helpful for us, for our staff, or for taxpayers and residents. I would go um, one step further and say that not only would this be unhelpful, it would also put us through unnecessary angst at a time when our residents and businesses are looking for us to continue to operate in the calm, cool, and collected manner that we have been doing so over the past 10 weeks. This is not about us. This is about our residents and what is best for our community. Um, you know, at our last council meeting uh, last month, we supported a resolution from the municipality of Midland calling on the federal government to transfer municipalities the revenue we get from taxation so we could pass along savings to our residents and stimulate our economies. Uh, since our last meeting, I forwarded all members of council a copy of the proposal of the Canadian Federation of Municipalities to the federal government for a $10 billion municipal support package. And just this past Friday, the president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario sent a letter to the Prime Minister and Premier Ford regarding the financial stabilization of municipal governments and the needed recovery of local economies. I've spoken with our MPs and our MPPs about this. And let's also recognize that our city staff have been amazing throughout this ordeal. Our CAO and management have taken numerous steps to reduce costs to be fair to our ratepayers and to staff. Numerous spending decisions have been delayed. We haven't hired seasonal and temporary workers, and we've done different work to keep our employees productive. This has allowed our residents and businesses to keep our, um, to be able to, our, this has allowed our residents and businesses to be able to count on their city of Belleville services during a time when they have enough to on worry their about with their health, their family, and their jobs. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We haven't known uh, since March 16th when we first made the decision to close our municipal buildings. Since then, we haven't panicked. We've taken it day by day, and we've made the necessary decisions. We've done very well by keeping our wits about ourselves and by being calm, cool, and collected. We're going to continue to do this, and when the time comes to set our 2020 budget, we'll do so then. Again, I think that uh, proceeding ahead without any of this information is pure speculation, and all it will do is cause us to um, create more angst in the community. I think that discussions about cutting uh, programs and expenditures and staff positions is not healthy, particularly in this environment. And uh, if someone wants to uh, make a motion, they're permitted to do so, but uh, it's difficult to get a committee to review something when we're managing these things day by day, just like everyone else is doing. Councillor Sanison, I know you were next in the line under new business. I'll recognize you. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, you certainly uh, touched uh, across the broad spectrum uh, very eloquently. I, uh, I guess I would come back to a couple of things. Number one, as chair of the Finance Committee, I would encourage uh, all members of Council that if they have a suggestion or a comment or would like to see something uh, undertaken by this, the Finance Committee, that, uh, that they bring it forward to me and uh, rather than drop it on me in a, in a council meeting. Uh, my comment would be, if you've got time to talk to uh, the treasurer and the CAO and the mayor, then certainly you've got time to talk to the chair. Uh, I will also say that uh, Councillor Carr and Councillor Thompson have, have brought forward suggestions uh, to me. And I did uh, uh, discuss those with uh, the treasurer and they were specifically around budget and also the financial impact uh, as a result of COVID. And there are, uh, as the mayor said, uh, so many uh, variables that are in a state of flux. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, very difficult to put together a meaningful uh, snapshot. However, the treasurer has told me that when they're in a position to do that, they'll bring it forward. Now. I would also remind Councillor Thompson. Am I still there? Yep, you're still going. Go ahead. Okay, I lost my screen. I would also remind Councillor Thompson and, and Councillor Williams that they were opposed to asking the federal government for relief, and they did not support the uh, resolution from Midland. That ten billion dollars, hopefully, some of that will find its way to Belleville and we will be able to shoulder 
or buffer the impact on our on our tax holder or taxpayers. So uh, I just wanted to uh, mention those comments and certainly uh, look forward to that notice of motion coming forward where we can discuss it and debate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanis and Councillor Millette and then Councillor uh, Colhane. Councillor Millette, if you want to activate your microphone. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, just a couple of things in regard to, uh, to the uh, to the matter we're discussing. Uh, your Worship, you're in your prepared uh, notes. I, I note that you said that while this may make some of us feel, I think it's more, uh, from what I understand, and this is the first I'd heard of this today, but I too had some concerns that. There, there seemed to be a disconnect for us counselors in, in, in information, at least. Uh, um, and, and a little bit, if there's any feeling, it's a feeling of, uh, of some angst that we aren't, in fact, uh, getting a fulsome picture of where they're at. I, and further to, you know, I, I don't think it was, it, this would just make us feel good. I think it would do more to uh, what the original uh, concept was was to, you know, we're the governing body, us counselors. Um, and, you know, I think if even if we could agree to perhaps have some form of briefing notes uh, bi-weekly or something uh, for, I don't, for us, because they are a work in progress, um, something to that effect. But, I mean, to just dismiss it and then get... Uh, a little bit prickly because of the process. I don't think that's productive either. I would like to see some common ground here, and and I understand that the uh, uh, the chair Sanderson. I mean, uh, he's been in regular contact with uh, with uh, um, Ms. Hines, the treasurer, and and your worship. I understand that you and, and Mr. Bowie are likely involved daily in the uh, in some of these discussions. image of where we're at and how we might um, make decisions of what we know about. It's understood that there are uh, there are issues that we uh, simply don't know coming down the pipe, but we do know the picture to date as of months of, of the effects of COVID, and we need to perhaps have a better picture of where that has impacted so far, what the impact on our city employees, our various city departments have already been. So I think that's all we're asking here. I don't think it's asking too much. So. Well, thanks. Those Councilor, are my comments. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mutt. You were broken, uh, broken and out a number of times uh, throughout that. It was hard to, uh, to hear, but um, you know, I would say we're having conversation here and uh, I don't consider any of it to be, to be prickly. Um, but the one key thing I would suggest now is that there has been nothing that has prevented members of council from doing their job since the um, March 20th meeting uh, when we first were dealing with this. Um, you know, you've heard already from a number of members of council who have been corresponding and communicating with Director Hines, getting information. Um, and certainly we don't just do the work of the city when we're here at our meetings. Most of the work happens before that. And, uh, and anyone is welcome to contact uh, CEO Bove and contact Director Hines. And you can get information in respect to how we're uh, job sharing different people, what steady staff are doing, uh, which uh, seasonal employees have not been, uh, have not been hired um, and, and, and whatnot. And I'd, and, and I'd encourage you to start doing that if you're not doing it, uh, because that is such the important uh, information you get uh, during those conversations is invaluable. Um, to proceed with setting a budget where we now decide on headcounts and staffing levels, as well as what reactions that we have to take as a city to deal with a potential COVID-19 revenue hole if we don't receive uh, funding uh, at this point was just be, would be entirely speculation. And, uh, and that's the point that, uh, that I'm saying. Uh, Director Hines and CEO Bove, uh, I don't speak with them daily with respect to the financial uh, situation in the city. They are managing it and they're managing it well. Uh, they are being respectful of taxpayers um, and also being respectful of residents who require the services of the city. And uh, when the information is available to us and it is prudent to go ahead with setting the budget, uh, the director will, uh, will let the finance committee uh, know to, to, to do their work and then that will come to council and will be given proper, proper notice. Um, whether we go 
three months or six months or nine months, um, all municipalities are in the same boat. And many of them have not set their budgets yet. And those that have set their budgets are going to have to uh, review them and make changes. So, uh, you know, again, it's the will of council what we want to do going forward. Um, you know, but for us to, uh, to have a meeting again and, um, and, uh, uh, and use uh, staff resources and their time when they're focusing on getting the city through this, this crisis, to me, isn't the best use of our time right now, um, as we're going to have to do it again uh, in any event. Councillor Culhane, I have you next in the list. Do you want to activate your microphone? And oh, go ahead. For, I just wanted to indicate that I couldn't hear most of what uh, Councillor Sanderson was saying. So I wanted Mark to see that I couldn't. You mean Councillor Millet? The no, I, I don't have anything to add. Right. Thank yeah. You. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, and, and this is the challenge we have when we are meeting electronically. And, um, you know, um, we're trying to do the best we can to get through this. And I, certainly I appreciate all members of council's uh, cooperation in this. Councillor Carr, you see, uh, you uh, gestured you wanted to speak on this. Yeah, you wanna activate your microphone? Go ahead, sir. Thank you. I guess um, at the bare minimum, uh, I know the CAO provided uh, council with a briefing note back on the uh, 18th of April, which is very helpful. And perhaps maybe now that we're coming up on the 18th of May, another month, um, I can appreciate that we can reach out to staff at any time, and, and I think some do, and, and, and on a regular basis. The, it would, rather than have staff chasing a million questions all at once, um, a briefing note as to the actions that have taken place, the financial impact, some of that, again, for our eyes only, just to have an understanding. I think um, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but I know just having a pulse of an understanding of where things are at. Um, I don't think we can make any decisions uh, right now. There's a lot of unknowns, but at least having them another understanding. So that was very helpful on the 18th of April. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable that every 30 days, if there's some actions that have been taken or continuation of financial impacts that members of council should at least be aware of that. Um, I know that uh, as a library board, uh, we have gone back as a finance committee and we'll be coming to the board and we have made some adjustment so we're having those conversations uh, uh, to be prepared uh, for what the the future may hold um, we're hoping there might be some money there um, on the library side through uh, sports and culture uh, and that portfolio so if at the very least if we could have a briefing note I would be satisfied with that and that way it's uh, one package coming out um, to to members of council for our eyes only and it gives us an understanding going forward and then uh, Whatever happens in terms of motions and, and proposals going forward, they happen. But uh, I know for me, I would just like to be informed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carr. Um, anyone else for anything else on new business? All right, uh, we don't have any motions today. Uh, notice a motion. Councillor Williams, do you wanna make a notice of motion? Yes, and my notice of motion will be that staff presents a budget no later than June 30 for council approval. Draft budget, I guess I'm gonna add in there because it'll be a draft budget. All right, just one moment, please. I wanna mute my microphone, please, uh, Mr. Coyle. So Councillor Williams, just on the, your um, notice of motion, um, I would uh, suggest that rather than that you say they present a draft budget, you, uh, that they present a proposed budget uh, because we, we deal, all budgets are draft until we, um, until we deal with them, but you're bringing forth a budget that you want council, I'm assuming to endorse a direction or uh, make decisions on. So it should be the proposed budget. Um, uh, and then we'll deal with this at our next meeting. But at well, least I, I disagree. I think I think what what I've heard and what I'm making the motion on is very clear that this is not, as has been stated, a full budget. This is a draft budget that will be continually worked on for the year. As I've heard, I have not seen a draft budget. Nobody in council, well, and maybe the finance committee has. No. So therefore, 
this is what I'm asking for. We can still debate the draft budget, yeah. but that's what I want. I don't think a final budget is in uh, the best interest of this council right now. I think a draft budget is what we want to see. That's okay, what I'm just, just one more minute then. Okay, well, I'm just talking with uh, Director McDonald and, and CEO Bove about the, about the process here. Um, you know, the challenge here is that uh, um, our budget process that we follow is that uh, um, city staff and the executive management team put together, uh, go through a process and put together a document, which is then um, forwarded to the finance committee. The finance committee goes through and considers it and asks questions and uh, send some things back. And then that package is presented to council when it is, when it is done. Um, to deal with a draft or a proposed or a working document or however we want to do it um, kind of sounds like it's, uh, as Director McDonald said, it suspends the work of the finance committee, which, you know, again, what we're, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, to I think, um, you know, show like we're doing our jobs. Um, the jobs right now that are being a very good job right now that is being done by Director Hines and CEO Bove in terms of managing the city under the parameters of the 2019 budget. And when we make changes to the 2020 budget, it'll, it'll obviously impact that. So um, we'll, um, we'll work with Councillor Williams over the next couple of days to make sure that the wording is such that it is in order. Um, I understand what his intention is for us to discuss it. Um, but, you know, the issue is that that budget, when it comes forth to council, uh, if the motion is approved, council will have the ability to, to approve it and then it's done. And then it takes a reconsideration motion to make any amendments, which is why we're cautious about bringing something forward when we don't know what the outcome is going to be down the road. And this is where the whole thing is. I understand we want residents to, to know that we're working hard and we're working on their behalf and we're being fiscally responsible and we're planning it, but we're gonna be dealing with almost 100% uh, uncertainty when it comes to what uh, expenses uh, that we are not gonna be able to cover uh, from the federal and provincial governments. You know, we're tracking right now uh, all of our COVID-19 related expenses um, because we know that that is what the province has asked us to do. The police service board is looking at all of their expenses, breaking it out, what are special COVID-19 expenses. Um, I talked about the work that the AMO and the Canadian Federation of Municipalities are all doing, um, but I don't know what's going to be the end result. And, uh, and to, you know, to go down that process, that's the troubling thing. But um, Director McDonald will reach out to you, Councillor Williams, to make sure that the wording is, um, is appropriate to what your intention is and that it is in order. Um, so that we can uh, debate it at our, at our next meeting. Uh, anyone else for notice of motions? All right, uh, I'll move then on to announcements. Does anyone have any announcements they would like to make uh, today? Um, Councillor Kelly, you wanna activate your microphone and I'll recognize Thank you. you, go ahead. Uh, for you, Mr. Chair, just a couple of, a uh, few announcements here. I, I just wanted to acknowledge that this is uh, nursing week mm -hmm. across the country, kicked off today and wanna thank all the nurses that work at BGH and area hospitals and all the other uh, healthcare workers doing a great job during very stressful time with uh, COVID. Also too, um, I'm on the board for Hastings Prince Edward Public Health along with uh, Councillor Sanderson. And uh, we had a conference call last week and then we received a nice note from Minister Todd Smith that the Hastings Prince Edward Public Health Board has the best uh, testing numbers for COVID-19 and long-term care. So uh, we know that that particular health or age group in long-term care facilities across Ontario has been hit hard. 
the hardest in COVID-19, uh, but here with Hastings, Prince Edward Public Health, uh, reassuring to know that uh, their team is doing such a great job with the testing. Um, and final thing I wanted to get in, it was a week ago today, I uh, had an opportunity to uh, spend some time with uh, a nurse from Hastings Prince Edward Public Health, and her name is Christy Reeve. She is the public health nurse working in harm reduction and outreach for priority populations. And we spent the afternoon together traveling around Belleville and meeting the most vulnerable residents of our city, the homeless. And uh, Christy is a compassionate uh, nurse. She has built up quite a rapport relationship with those that uh, are homeless. And I had an opportunity to uh, deliver food and uh, show some support to them, also drop off some personal hygiene products. And uh, it was so educational for me. And uh, mental health is a key factor. Uh, but these folks are someone's daughter someone's son and uh, they're human beings and uh, i'm going to be bringing forward some uh, possibly new ideas or strategies for the city uh, that what we can do for those most vulnerable in our community uh, in the next month or two working on some game stuff right now and making some outreach calls to other cities to see what seems to be working uh, because we can always do more so I want to thank Christy Reeve for what a day uh, a week ago today. Um, and thank you for your work uh, in the community. You make a difference every day for these individuals. Good, certainly we all echo that. Uh, and uh, and congratulations to uh, to you and Councillor Sanderson and everybody on the Prince Edward Health, um, Prince Edward Hastings Health Board. Uh, those are truly impressive numbers. And in a time where the Premier has called out uh, underperforming uh, health uh, public health boards across Ontario for testing with long-term care. Uh, the fact that we've completed all of our residents in our area um, and almost, I think all the staff by now, but they were almost at all staff uh, last week. We've done well over uh, 4,400 tests in our entire region. It's very, very good work uh, indeed. Anyone else for announcements? All right. Um, I would like to proclaim May 11th to 17th as Powerline Safety Week. Our municipal resource, Alexicon Energy, is partnering with the Electrical Service, I'm sorry, the Electrical Safety Authority in urging residents to avoid deadly distractions by practicing three critical steps, stop, look, and live. More people than usual are home and are pursuing outdoor improvement projects, but with greater opportunity comes increased risk. It is important as it is as important as ever for people to remain vigilant and exercise caution when working near power lines. I would like to proclaim uh, today, May 11th, Nurses Appreciation Day here in the city of Belleville. I'd also like to proclaim May the 16th as Do Something Good for Your Neighbor Day in the city of Belleville. I'd like to proclaim the week of May 18th to 23rd as uh, Victoria Order of Nurses Week in the city of Belleville. Nurses have been risking their lives every day in order to keep the rest of us healthy. In order to recognize this important week, the Bridge Street Bridge and the Belleville sign will be lit up in blue. I would also like to proclaim May as Huntington Disease Awareness Month and announce that we will be lighting up the Bridge Street Bridge and the Belleville sign in blue as well. It's my pleasure to issue now the following proclamation. Whereas the fear of losing one's mind and the fear of losing control of one's body are among the most profound human fears. And whereas both losses occur in Huntington disease, an inherited and fatal brain disorder that strikes in the prime of life. And whereas every child of a parent with Huntington disease faces a 50% risk of inheriting this genetic disorder, and there is no effective treatment and no known, known cure yet. And whereas the Hunting Society of Canada has initiated and supported research into the cause and nature of this fatal disease, and the work of the society has brought new hope to the people with Huntington disease and families who bear the burden of this affliction. And whereas research continues to offer the promise of early diagnosis, treatment techniques, and ultimately a cure for Huntington disease, and whereas the month of May will be reserved, observed as Huntington Disease Awareness Month in communities across Canada. Now, therefore, I, Mitch Panchuk, Mayor of the City of Belleville, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2020 as Huntington Disease Awareness Month in Belleville and urge all our residents and citizens to lend their support to the Huntington Society of Canada 
in its efforts to unravel not only the mystery of Huntington disease, but also a wide range of other genetic, neurological, and psychiatric disorders affecting the lives of so many Canadians. I encourage everyone to talk to your neighbors about Huntington's disease and help educate Canadians on what Huntington's disease is. Um, I also want to, uh, before closing, um, mention that one of our former city councillors, uh, Mike Graham, is currently receiving palliative care at home after fighting a long battle for the last five years. He served a 30 plus year career with Belleville Police and also a term on Belleville City Council. I ask that you keep him and his family in your prayers and thoughts today. With that said, uh, we all need to look uh, out for each other with special attention to those of us who this period of isolation impacts the most. Let's understand uh, again, as I've been speaking about the last few months, that depression and other forms of mental illness are real and kindness, checking in on friends and neighbors and helping to get along during the stressful time makes such a difference. I would like to thank council uh, for your cooperation again uh, for another meeting, which we don't uh, enjoy doing it. We want to get together in person and to be able to uh, do our jobs. Um, but I want to thank you for your flexibility and your cooperation. I want to thank city staff for their assistance with setting up these meetings, particularly um, Manager Coyle. And, uh, and I want to thank everyone who's working in the city of Belleville uh, in every way, whether it's providing essential services, providing municipal services on the front lines. Uh, I am so proud of the work that we have done in our community. And we are seeing the performance in the spreading, uh, the numbers of the spread in our area, showing that we have truly stopped that spread and we're now able to benefit from some of the relaxations. Um, with that, I uh, will ask that uh, uh, for a confirmatory bylaw, that bylaw number 2020-99, a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting held on May the 11th, 2020, be read a first, second, and third time, and finally pass this 11th day of May, 2020. If I get a motion, please, moved by Councillor Culhane, seconded by Councillor Kelly. All in favor, it's carried. Motion to adjourn, moved by Councillor Carr, seconded by Councillor McCaw. And um, best wishes to everybody, uh, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you around. Uh, all in favor, motion's carried, thank you.